afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a little talk about types. Why? I usually start my talks with a little discussion as to why on earth would I talk about a subject like this. Um, well, the type system in C++ is very powerful. Um, and I've seen a lot of people not using it. I've seen a lot of people who spend their life still using primitives, using ints and floats, and not using the facilities of the language. It's been a long time that this language has been around. It's a long time the type system has been around. There are things we can do with it that make for better code, but without a lot of cost. So I was hoping that I might be able to uh, explore a little bit of, of that with you. OK, what do we want? So there are three desiderata here, uh, things that we probably want. I want code that works. I want something that's going to help me to stop making mistakes. There are plenty of ways of getting things wrong. I would like it if the compiler and the language conspired against me to stop mistakes. And I preferably like that at compile time. If I might do something that isn't right, for some definition of the word right, I would rather know about it at compile time than later. And I want, preferably, the runtime cost of this to be zero. I want to move everything if I can to compile time from a safety point of view, and then have the runtime exactly the same as if I didn't do this. So if I use ints and floats, I want exactly the same as that. C++ is a really good language for doing this one. You can't really do this in other languages quite so well, but this is something I think you can do quite well. I'm going to show you examples of this one. Why do I want the zero overhead? Because if there is any overhead at all, somebody's going to go, nah, don't want to do that one, that's safety stuff. Ha, I don't want that. I want it to go fast. I want the full power of the machine. That's probably why you're using C++ anyway, is because you want that level of control, that level of power. Let's see if we can do something about that and, and get to the point where we can have this safety without paying a runtime cost. There's a compile time cost, yes. There's a software cost in terms of doing this, yes. But I don't want any runtime cost, neither in speed nor in size. I also would like to be able to say, well, actually, I don't want to have to do this every time. How do I make this into a library? How can I make this generic? How can I make it such that we can do this regularly without having to reinvent this thing every time? So I want it safe, I want it fast, I don't want it general. Um, I can't see many people arguing that, that those aren't things that we would want. So let's take a little uh, diversion. Let's go back in history. Let's go back to uh, assembler programming. So assembler programming, machine code, down to that one. Basically, all you have is the types that you have in the, in the CPU. You have some registers. Registers can have uh, addresses in them, and they can have values in them. There's nothing to stop you saying, well, I'm going to load that uh, pointer and do some stuff with it and do some arithmetic and, and put it back again. There's nothing to help you. You're at your own mercy, as it were. So you can do this sort of kind of punning, where you can just move things around. There is a lot of machine efficiency here, because that's what you get is what you, what you use. Nothing else. There is no overhead. However, it puts a large burden on the programmer to get this right. So you have programmer effort. It is difficult to maintain. It's difficult to do. You say, well, here's my program. Here's what I'm trying to do. How do I translate it into that? And so you always are translating into that. And when you're reading this code, you're trying to translate it back into the domain. These, these two are far apart. There's nothing to help you at all other than the comments, which you hope are useful. And you know, you've got a comment per line that's saying, OK, now register three contains this now. OK, I've done this. OK, or you might even write something in there that says, this is the formula I'm trying to do. Right, OK, so that's where, where we started with that one. Then people started saying, OK, well, maybe we can have some higher level language than this. And this is where languages like B and BCPL came in. They said, right, actually, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to give you this, but we're not going to have any types. So you ended up with typeless programming. And you were, typing, you were uh, programming with basically just the machine word. 
and there wasn't anything about it, it wasn't an address or anything else. So as an example, um, in BCPL, uh, 3 times 4 plus 5 with a parentheses, yeah, that gives you a value 27. It's great. If you accidentally miss out the star, you then end up with a call to function at the address 3 with a value 9. Because 3 is an entirely valid function. It's just a pointer to a function. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, obviously, you want to just jump to the random middle of memory for this, for, because you had a typo. The C preprocessor is also like this one. It just takes strings and smashes them up uh, and substitutes them. Um, it really doesn't help you in any way uh, because there's nothing in the hash define kind of macro language that does that one. And then, then you just get this huge, great sort of kind of, well, yeah, I got a problem and I've made a mistake there and I've used it 27 places, so I get 27 random errors that, that sort of kind of seem the same. But it doesn't really help you. There's nothing in there at all. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I've not put in things like uh, JavaScript and other uh, things like that, which are also, there's some sort of kind of type ambiguity going on there. But this is basically just machine types, or in the case of C preprocessor, it's just strings. So that doesn't, there's no help. This is the fast thing, but no help, no safety. So machine types. Right, okay, so if we use C, we've suddenly got some types. We've got int, we've got float. And we've got pointers. Now I can't just take an int and a pointer and mix them around. Now I actually have to be uh, nefarious and say, yes, I'm actually going to cast one to another. OK, it's, so those little sort of kind of C style things like that, that C style cast. In C++, it's reinterpret cast to make it just a little bit nastier uh, to type. But it's easy to cast things in C. But at least you actually have to try to do this. So you avoid those sort of type puns that you get in assembler. You get high machine efficiency because C is a what you see is all you get language. It's nothing other than what you want there. It doesn't give you anything at all other than about structure copy. That's about the only thing that, that you get for free out of it. Better program efficiency. Not necessarily good, but, good, but better program efficiency. Um, <clears throat> and it's linked to the underlying machine types directly. We now added things like structs. And we've added aggregates like uh, arrays. So we've got a bit more structure there, but we haven't got a lot of structure. And those are really just things inside the language. We, yes, we can create structs of our own type of things, and we can have pointers to those. That's, that's sort of kind of a bit of stuff there. Next thing, abstraction through files. We can do modules and hide stuff. But again, this is relatively coarse. And it's not fine grain at all. We can't express any domain concepts. All we've done is just carve things up a little bit we still have this translation gap. So there's still, well, OK, I can do that out here. But we, we've brought the language and the machine closer together. But still, there is a translation there. We can't code directly in our domain. Compile time checking, not much of that, really, uh, because there isn't much you can do in the language. There's no proof of anything other than, yes, uh, yes or no, I can do this. And that's a pointer. That's an integer. I can't do anything without a cast. The same goes for C++ if you just use primitives. So fairly low level C++. I see uh, a range of people using C++ from those using the latest super duper C++ 14, 17 very dark template stuff, all the way down to people who are still writing C in C++. Um, ah, what happens if we say, actually, look, there's a type system. Let's use it. Let's get some form of higher level C++. Let's start putting our domain knowledge into that. We've got objects. We have got things in there. We've got invariants, pre and post conditions, types, ranges, all sorts of kind of things that we should be able to do. So let's have a look at using the C++ type system to create lightweight abstractions that capture that domain knowledge. So instead of it being comments, and unfortunately, compilers don't read comments, um, I'm not even sure that developers read comments at times, but there you go. Let's, have, uh, let's put that directly into the program so that the machine can check it without sacrificing machine efficiency. So the thing about the type system is it's a 100% proof system. It says, yes, you can do this, or no, you can't. There aren't any bits. It's like, well, maybe you can do that. So this means that if it passes the type system, these are the things that you can say about stuff with a type system. And there are lots of questions that you can't answer with a type system. But 
Let's see which ones you can. Let's see how we can use the type system to get rid of certain problems. If you use it well, and there is that thing about using it well, it makes your code safer, and it makes it more reusable. It's generally a nicer experience. Well, I believe so anyway. Others might disagree. Uh, Bjarne Struistrup likes this. Uh, he's done various talks where he mentions this kind of stuff. Some of the things I'm uh, using are based on some of, the thing, some of the ideas he's put forward. So this is the miracle computation, which is when at runtime I have all the machine types. Now, whether I'm using assembler or C or C++, basically at runtime I've only got machine types. And that's what determines my efficiency. With C, I have, at compile time, I have the language types, plus or minus a little bit of white lies around C structs, which are just a, a small thing on here, so there's a little bit of struct and things going on there. Um, in C++ we have that, but we have application types. We can build these bigger, more complex types, types that reflect something about our domain, something about what, what we're trying to do, rather than just holders of state. Um, yes, the other thing is there is things like RTTI at, um, in C++, but I'm not uh, going to uh, do that one. But the big picture is like this. And the whole point is this stuff is thrown away. You don't have to carry it around with you. So this is the wonderful thing about the type system. You put as much as you can in the type system, and then it's gone. You don't have to carry it around. Other languages carry this around at runtime. If you're doing this with Python, for instance, you're carrying all around this at runtime, and the proof happens at runtime is, oh, can I call that method on this thing? Oh, I'll just wait till I get there. And you don't know when you write a Python program, it's like, is that type safe or not? Well, I'll run it. Well, it didn't crash this time. Maybe, it's, maybe it is type safe. If it was type safe on this run, maybe not next one. But this is why if you're trying to write something that's, that's safe, an environment where crashing is really not a good idea, then having a proof system, 100% proof system like types, is a better way of doing it. So the miracle of this is we throw all that lot away, and we're left with just that. So here's an example I often use when I'm teaching people. Right, I have a date and take three integers. I look at that and go, int, int, int. So is this year, month, day? Is this day, month, year for the three parameters, or is it some broken other thing that some other country uses? Um, uh, I can't tell um, from this. So uh, I could put names in there, but the names there are for humans. They are not checked. So if I said day, int, year, comma, int, month, comma, uh, it wouldn't make any difference. Hopefully a human read read that, and if you're doing some, your IDE might pop that up, that's nice. But again, it relies on the human to do that one, and there's no checking. If you get it wrong, there's nothing you can do about it. If, on the other hand, I use year, month, and day as three separate types, I can't get this one wrong. I can't put them in the wrong place if they are separate types. And the compiler will shout at me if I try to put the month and the year. Well, OK, so maybe I just do this with a uh, using year equals int, modern type def, uh, ADS like that. No, nope, that's not going to help us because this doesn't introduce a new type. This just introduces an alias. If I did that for the three, they would all still be int. It's just documentation, really, at that point. It doesn't help us. We actually need a full separate type to do this in order to do that one. Let's look at some other possible things. Well, here's a, a nice little one, which is um, what happens when you're dealing with physical quantities? A lot of people who are doing C++ are dealing with things in the real world. Uh, either they're controlling machinery or they're looking at things in the real world. They're modeling stuff that has real physical consequences. So if I try to do this one here with uh, meters and seconds, uh, and uh, I then so I have meters of 3.4 seconds, and I try to add them together. I wanted to cal calculate a velocity, meters divided by seconds. Oh dear, I mistyped it. Compiles, and it runs. Oh dear. If I'm lucky, it gives me a really wrong result, and I notice. If I'm unlucky, it sort of gives me a result that's believable. And that's really the nasty thing when you're doing numeric calculation. You go, do I believe that number? Hmm. OK. So I've got something here. This, this doesn't make sense. And now if I introduce feet as well as meters, I can now add meters to feet. No sense. 
Compiler says, yep, okay, go ahead. Don't mind. Now, this picture on the right here is a picture from the Mars Climate Orbiter. So the Mars Climate Orbiter crashed into Mars in 1999. Now, the reason it did that is because uh, one of the interfaces, Lockheed Martin, were using pound seconds. So they were using imperial or English units, and the other part was using newton seconds. So they were out by a factor of 4.45. So instead of this nice, wide, orbit round Mars like that, they came in 4.45 times too low and created a $100 million hole. So a question for you. If they can spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing this and getting it wrong, and the amount of testing and time and effort went into that, what chance do we have? Do any of you have $100 million on your development team? Probably not. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just use some way of stopping this happening for free? Or essentially for free, certainly free at runtime. So we can get rid of these errors. We don't need to have these ones if we stop using primitives. Let's use a thing called the whole value pattern. So this was a pattern that was first identified by Kent Beck uh, in Smalltalk. Um, Kent Beck was uh, one of the guys uh, from the Extreme Programming world, uh, and uh, this is the C++ version of it, called the whole value pattern. It's just wrapping thumping up. It's not that complicated. It's very straightforward. Notice I have, year has an explicit constructor, and it takes one argument. Explicit means do not create one of these unless I actually type the word year. Please do not create any temporaries. Please do not do any conversion unless I tell you. Now, the reason for this is because we want to make this explicit. We've gone from int, which is very wide, and we're going down to year, which is narrow. That is a narrowing conversion. We want to make sure that is controlled. We don't want arbitrary numbers to be turned into years. Operator int here, this is a user-defined conversion. It's implicit in this particular case because we can take the thing and move it back out. That's going from year back out to integer. That's safe. That's a widening conversion. It's not going to explode on you. So implicit uh, on the way out, explicit on the way in. <coughs> Here is a bit of C++11. This is a user-defined literal. Uh, and I pass this in, so underscore year, the, uh, uh, all of the uh, user-defined ones have to have an underscore in front of them. Operator double quotes, double quotes. I obviously ran out of things uh, on the keyboard at this point, but it's just going to return a year when you pass in uh, uh, an integer in this type. There are a fixed set of these, by the way, which is why it's unsigned long, long, because uh, it's done at compile time, because it's a literal, there's only a few signatures, and that's one of them. You can't put int there. You have to use the longest possible type. Now I can write 2016 underscore year, and that is actually a typed constant of type year. Hey, good, we've now got typed constants. Good. We're, we're moving in the right direction. Hmm. I want month and day. Uh, it's going to get boring quite quickly. I'm going to have to have multiple ones here. I'm not going to have, I'm going to have to sort of do cut and paste. Well, when I start to see commonality of structure, what's the thing I'm going to look for in C++? It's going to be templates, because templates are good. I like templates. And at the top here, I have an enum class unit type. So this unit one here is uh, uh, basically I'm calling it unit. That's what Bianna Strip called it, so I'm going to stick with this terminology. And at the top, I've got uh, an enum class, a scoped enum or strong enum. It doesn't have to be that one. I'm just using that because uh, for safety, so we don't get any conversions. So again, enum class doesn't convert to or from integer automatically, uh, or sorry, to integer automatically. And now I template on this type. I'm going to have unit of those different types. They are now different types. They're not aliases. They are different types. So I have the same thing here. And now I can say year is a unit of unit type, common, common, year type, and month and day. So I've written it once. I've used it three times. I've gained some advantage there in terms of now I have my type safe API. I've reduced that repetition. I've taken it away. It has the same efficiency as the primitive because it's just a wrapped up integer. Everything is in line. So there's no overhead. 
well, that's fine, but I can put a year and I can say, I can have a year that's minus 2,000. I can have a year that's, 30, that's 4 billion, or oh, sorry, uh, 2 billion or so. That's probably not what I want. Most domain types have got some range of values. There's obviously some, there's some numbers we're gonna have to have like that. So let's see what we can do here. So in this particular case, I can now say, I'm gonna put low and high as two extra parameters on there, on the template ones that say, here are the maximum and minimum values for my type. Because they are template parameters, they're not stored in the type, so it doesn't affect this. If you do size of this, it will be the size of int. So I'm going to initialize this one here. If it's less than the low or less than the high, I'm gonna throw the invalid argument. Um, and I just convert it back out again. So that is checking on the way in, and uh, it's now implicit on the way out. I've snuck in a bit of const expert there. I'm gonna look at this in a bit more detail. So const expert, C++11 says, on functions and con uh, constructors says, this can be run at compile time. It depends how it's called as to whether it is or not, um, but it can be called at runtime or at compile time. And now I can say a year is 1900 to 2100. So if I try to put in something that's 1,000 here, I put in something that's outside the domain, it quite simply throws. It throws at runtime because that's a runtime check. If, on the other hand, the context I'm calling it from is a const expert context, and I try to put that in, what will happen is that at compile time this will throw. Huh, what does compile time throw means? In that case, because it's not completed, essentially this will now give you an error. So this will not compile. Nice. So if I try to write a constant, won't compile. No runtime overhead, because that check is done at compile time. There is no compile time code, there's no runtime code at all. It's very powerful. Um, and allows you to do this one here if you have constants. Obviously, it can only be used with constants. Right, so that was just, I'll create a type. Whenever I want to do anything with that, I basically have to turn it back into an integer. I have no operations on this one. So that's, it, it gives us, it's a start. It says, gives me some thing. This is, this is something here and it has this range. Yeah, I can see that's useful. But the trouble is I can do things with it that don't make any sense in the domain. So there are some errors there. It just basically turns it back into an int or float or whatever. And those types are really just labels. We haven't really gained as much as we can. We're some of the way down the route, but not all the way. So let's now add the operations and get rid of the conversions. So the implicit conversion. So we're going to make the... And what we do in this case is we say, right, I've added explicit. So I now have an explicit operator here. So it says, right, okay, if you want to turn this back into an int, this is how you do it. But you only do it when I actually tell you to do it rather than automatically doing this one. If I didn't make it explicit and I just tried to say year plus what year, it would turn them into integers. So now I've got this type, I can wrap it up and say, these are the things I can do. I can have a year plus an integer or an integer plus a year, but I've not defined year plus year. It doesn't make sense to say this year, now, plus this year. Next year, yes. Or one plus this year is next year, but I can't do year plus year. It doesn't make sense in the domain. Year minus year, yes, I could do that. So I can now say, here are all the things I want. So I take the year that you've given me like this, I say, Make this an int, please. So I call this explicit operator like that. It gives me back an int. I add the one, and I go here, and I put it back through. I'm now checking again. So there is an overhead at this point because I'm doing a check in the constructor that says, are you actually going to take this out of range or not? So if it was 2300 and I did plus one for the previous one, it would now throw. So it's a question of do you want that or not, but we have to have a decision about that. And well, that's something for you to do. I'm going to miss off const expert on the rest of the slides because that will just make the slides too big. So what, uh, what do we do with operations? Well, in this particular case, date plus an integer. That makes sense. Uh, I'm assuming that adding an integer moves at a number of days. Uh, int plus date, yeah, date minus date, etc. Relational operators for date, yeah, that's cool, I can do that. That gives me a boolean. I can't multiply, you know, two times today 
it just, just seems wrong. I can't see what that would mean. But for some other type, a value type, because we're looking at value types in the moment, money times float. Yeah, well, I can do that. That's an interest calculation. I got 3% of the money I had before. Whatever, that's fine. That's what this is. I can divide it by that. Uh, I can have half the money I had last week. Um, I can compare the amount of money I had last week, or even do I still have that in my wallet? But I can't just add random floats like this, because this is not the same type. So we have every type wants to have a set of operations. And we can see that this is not a generic set of operations. Some things make sense, some things don't. How do we do this in a way that says, well, actually, we can do this without um, having to repeat this? OK. Let's first of all, we could say, well, I'm going to define some of these operations, and I'm going to let the caller do this. So I can push onto the caller to do certain things. So there is, for instance, here, for relational operators, there is something in the standard called stud, stud relops. And if you provide a type that has equals equals and less than, if you want the other four, just do using namespace std relops, and it includes four templates, nice big chunky templates like this, that will define the others for you in terms of operator less than and operator equals equals. But that's getting the client to do it, which is kind of nice. One of the reasons they're hidden away like this is because these are really big, greedy templates. They'll just match anything. And that's something that matches two Ts is a, bit, is a bit sort of kind of rapacious and just grab anything. So it's hidden over in a, away in a corner, and you have to go and ask for it explicitly. It only hands the relational operators. It's also making the client do the work, and it's not helping me to write my class. So let's try this. So this is a bit of CRTP. So this is an example that um, has been around for ooh, about a bit over 20 years. Uh, this first came up with Barton and Nachman in their book Scientific and Engineering C++, way back when. Um, you may hear it called the Barton and Nachman trick. It's not that. That's a mislabeling. Their trick is something else to do with friend injection. This is CRTP, the curiously recursive template pattern first noticed by Jim Complean, Cope. Um, Right, what is it going to do? Well, let's start here with my year. I'm inheriting publicly, public ordered of year. So I'm inheriting from a base class. OK. If I were going to try and do this in sort of traditional OO terms with virtuals and other things, I'd have a base class. It would say, here are, all the, here are the four relational operators, and I'd have a pure virtual function that said operator less than. I'd inherit from that. I'd have to implement the operator less than, and I could use all of the base library stuff that would then use the downcast at runtime to my less than operator and define it in terms of that. But we don't want to do it with virtuals for a number of reasons. So let's see how we can do this at compile time. Rather than a runtime downcast with virtual, we're going to do a compile time downcast. And that's what this is. So this derived thing here. What I want to do is to say, I've got base class, ordered, and I want, to go, I want to cast myself to the type that you are. So ordered wants to cast to this guy, which is that. So that and that have to be the same. And I do a static cast. So it's a downcast. It's done at compile time, and it's checked at compile time. If it's wrong, then the compiler won't let me do it. And that's what static cast does. It's for types related by the compiler. If I didn't do this, and I just said RHS less than star this, it would start looking for an operator less than in ordered. And it says, but there isn't one. The whole point is I want to use this guy's one, not that one. That's why I have to do this downcast. It looks very odd when you first see it. It says, why well, I'm inheriting from something that's defined myself. Anyway, once we've done that, we can now say, here we go. We can do operator greater than, which is that one which uses this one. And I've now managed to abstract all of that stuff into a base class. So I've managed to genericize it, make it reusable. Ah, fine. So we can make some very straightforward things here. We can say, well, OK, we just do this one here. That's in the library. So the downcast is done at compile time, which is nice. There's no overhead in terms of space or time for this one, because there's no state in that class, and, the comp and it's all compile time. It's all resolved at compile time, and some people refer to this as compile time polymorphism. 
If I used a virtual instead, I would not get this one. And virtual is not what we want to do here. Why? Well, I'd end up putting a vtable point in here. This has, currently this has the size of an int. So if that was four bytes on a, on a 64-bit machine, then I put in a vtable pointer of eight bytes plus the four bytes, and that get rounded up to 16. So I've gone from four bytes to 16 bytes. I would have a runtime dispatch. So I'd have to do the call at runtime. I can't make it const expert, so I can't do any constant stuff. It all forces into runtime evaluation because of the vtables. And it's almost certainly not going to be inlined. So I've made it bigger and slower, whereas with and uh, forced it at runtime. Your branch prediction is going to look at this and go, huh, that's a virtual call. Don't know. And that may give you just whatever, 10, 15 cycles store on your pipeline. So this is a very common technique in libraries like Boost. Um, and so it's just a, an idea of where you can do that one. Let's go back to um, the Mars thing. It's quite a lot on this slide here. So this is something that I'm using dimensions. So what have I got here? I've got a thing, that quantity, that represents a physical quantity that's got a type name and a unit system. So that basically is going to be, do I want it float or double or int? The unit system is saying, do I want SI units or imperial units or whatever? If I was doing this with currencies, that could be a currency flag or enum. And then I'm going to have some integers. In this case, I've just shown three, which is mass, length, and time. That'll be the other four, which would make up a seven for the full SI set. Operator plus between quantities is fine. I can only add quantities of the same. That's pretty straightforward. And I get something back to the same. I just go and convert them back to the relevant types and put them back to the constructor. That's very straightforward. There's no fun there. The fun is when I start doing things like this. Operator less than. OK, I can now essentially do some form of conversion or um, allowing me to do things that make physical sense. So I have mass length time for this one, mass length time for the other one. So first one divided by the second one. Well, I do the quantities here, but notice what I'm doing with this thing. This is compile time arithmetic that says, OK, well, if you're going to take m1 and it's going to be divided by this guy, then I need to do minus on each of these. My meters, it says, right, I've got a float, SI units. 0, 1, 0 says mass to the 0. Length to the power one, time to the zero. Seconds, similarly, zero, zero, one, mass length and time. And now when I do meters divided by seconds, what I'm going to get back is a velocity that has time one, uh, zero, one, minus one. So it actually gives me something that has the right dimensions. So I can't do meters plus seconds. If I try to do that, it says that's not allowed. You may get some horrible error message, but at least you're not allowed to do that. So we have got rid of that Mars Climate Orbiter problem. So uh, we, we've uh, avoided mixing the things up. We've avoided mixing up measurement units. And we can do whatever we want here with different flavors of types. So different uh, things that may be uh, things like uh, currency units. And if we can say, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Well, OK, so here's a technique you'll often see. This is used in the standard library a lot, which is reflection, compile time reflection. Remember I said that we throw all of that stuff away? So we have none of this information at runtime. That's great. We don't want it at runtime. We want runtime to be small and fast. But what happens if I want to do stuff at compile time? How do I find out about something? Well, I can do it myself, and you'll often find that template classes in the standard library, for instance, republish their template parameters. So here I go, pass in the type name V, and I, and I pass it out as value type. Vector of T, for instance, has a nested type that says value type is T. So you can find out what the type of container passed to you is. And I can also then republish the unit system, all these ones. So the, f the five parameters there all get republished. That's the only difference here. Why would I want to do such an exciting thing? Well, length is always float and SI units, like this. But I want a time that's compatible with that guy. Length value type and length unit sys. So I can query something. 
I can use a templated alias like this and say, well, look, mass is always going to be 1, 0, 0, but I want to be able to choose those guys. I might want to do something like this and say, well, okay, if you are SI units, then I do this, otherwise I do something else. For instance, when I'm printing this one out, I want to print things that say you know, kilograms and meters rather than feet and pounds. So that's all I've done there, really, which is just make it a little bit more reusable, a bit more exciting that way. But I haven't really found a way now of yet of, of working out which operations I can say, which ones I can do, which ones I can't do. So let's have a little look at this. What happens if I want to say, look, actually, I'd like to be able to have all this in the library and just pick and choose. For instance, year was saying year plus number was OK, but money plus number wasn't OK. So I don't want to add two things together, or do I want to add scalars or not? So I'm going to create uh, a templated traits class here. Uh, I've got a couple, of scale, a couple of booleans in there. I don't actually need to have those when that's really just for um, doc documentation and saying, don't do anything. And now I say operator plus for a type T, T plus integer. Well, that's fine. Requires here, so I'm doing a bit of an enable if magic. So if that trait has got add scalar in it like that, then I want to enable this operation. If that is true, then enable if will return void, which means this has a definite type, which means this exists. If this is false, then uh, enable if does not return any type at all. And Sfine says, this template does not exist. It's not an error. That's why the is not an error in Sfine. So it basically just says, this template does not exist. So I can turn the templates on and off. So I can say, oh, by the way, I want these things in my type and not those types. If I want to add two types together like this, so I can say, well, values are here and scale is there. I can do the same kind of thing. That's the library. And then when I actually want to use it, I can say, OK, right, I want to be able to add scalars. Thank you. So I can produce a specialization for my type. And there we go. That works. That doesn't. It's all in a library. I can just basically say what I want. I'm now getting to the point where I'm sort of kind of starting to define a domain-specific language. And I can say, well, here's some properties of my thing. It's going to be an int. It's going to have this range. It has these operations. So I can start to be a bit more. Uh, definite about what's going on, um, which means that I can embed more in there. So let's have a look. Where are we now? So let's look at the generated code. So in this case, I'm going to do some stuff with some constants. So I've got this distance here, uh, like this. So this is distance. This is the thing with uh, length meters. and uh, uh, So this has got all the quantity stuff, user-defined literals, uh, different things here. So uh, distance plus distance. I'm gratuitously doing something here, which is using the CRTP. Here's the greater than to create one of those. Yes, it's a bit yucky code, defining by that, so I get a velocity and then return it. When I compile that, what do I get? I get return five as the answer. It's gone crunch. It's got rid of all of it. There is, that's it. So const, use define literal, physical dimensions, CRTP, it's all gone. We've just got the thing we wanted. Now, this is for an example with constants. That's fine. But uh, most of the time, you're not doing constant stuff. So let's see what happens when you start doing this with uh, actual real runtime values. So I've done the same thing here. So that's the, uh, the original one here, the same calculation with distance, etc. And this is the same one with primitives. Compile this with clang uh, and 03, and I get exactly the same generated assembler code, which is not bad in either case, really. Lightly edited so it'll fit on a slide. But uh, apart from that, you get the same. GCC isn't quite as good as Clang on this one. There are one or two extra bits and pieces uh, hanging around in here, uh, which I haven't quite worked out why. So uh, anybody who's a, a Clang optimization specialist, can you go and talk to the GCC guys and just get rid of that one or two extra things? But just to show you what it can do, that this really is, I said there wasn't any overhead, and I meant it. So I thought that was kind of nice, really. Even if that's really horrible code on the left, and I never want to write anything like that, and I would shout at people if they did. So that was one value type. That was numeric. There's quite a lot of stuff that you do there. And, and if you're in a C++ world, you're often dealing with numbers that have some meaning. Um, 
There's one way. Now let's have a look at strings. This example came up when talking to people in the automotive industry because they said, well, okay, you've got some strings uh, and uh, you probably don't want to be doing dynamic memory allocation. So standard string is not your friend here. You want to have some fixed size strings that you can define what's going on. So we had this one here. We said this is a string uh, and it's going to have this uh, size which is a compile time constant, and it's going to be null terminated, and it's always going to fit in, etc. Great, fine. So we looked at that. And we're trying to get rid of this sort of kind of uh, the behavior that you get with uh, string, with uh, const char star stuff that you get in C programs, which is, right, okay, so do I do str copy, str n copy? How long is this one? Here's an array. Oh, here's a pointer. I've forgotten how long it is. That kind of problem that, that caused all the problems with with uh, internet overflows uh, a long time ago. I think we've got rid of the, most of those now. Strand copy, it will just do the, the copy, and strand copy, unfortunately, doesn't put a null on the end if it happens to be the right length, so I have to assume, I have to make sure it's got a null on the end. So that's, I hope it's gonna be safe now, but there's a policy decision in here. This is not particularly generic, because this says you throw some string at a uh, uh, const star at it, um, it's going to truncate silently. Now, that's maybe what you want, but there are other options. What would happen if you were doing this one? You would go, well, actually, look, I want to put this into the diagnostic log because you've truncated something, and that really shouldn't happen. Okay, yeah, fine. Uh, I've got something. I've got this menu option. It's translated into German, and it's overflowed something because it's always bigger than every other language. Then uh, it's fine, but actually it's expected. It's okay, and if it truncated, I'm not that worried, but please tell me so I can go and fix it. You might go, actually, look, this is really bad. I want to do something I need to recover because somebody, some, I've got something down the wire, and this is all just terribly wrong. Can I reinitialize? We're, we're in a bad place. You might even go, look, like, really, really bad. Can you reboot the system? Because I think there's, there's just something. I'm completely screwed. I have no idea what's going on because that really shouldn't overflow. Um, or if you're saying, well, actually, now I'm in a test system. At this point, I want you to call, go here. And instead of doing this one here, I want you to call debug break and stop me right now so I can see what's going on, where this came from. These are all policy decisions. And you could make a, uh, a discussion about uh, which you want. And I'm sure you could come up with some other ones. So let's look at a uh, way of doing this with policy stuff. So I have a fixed string like this. Instead of using str n copy, I basically have to write this out. No, I have to do all of the sort of kind of hard work. Yay, good, oh, I love that expression, it's so nice. Um, at some point we have to uh, stop and check, and if I get to the end and it's the last character is not a null, then I need to call the overflow policy and I'm passing in these things. In this particular case here, my overflow policy, I've just defaulted to this thing that's going to print out. Could be whatever you like. So here, if I have hello, a fixed size of eight, it, go, it says, yeah, that's okay. Hello here with a fixed size of five. That's not got enough room for the null. That's now going to call the uh, policy, in which case it's going to print out that message. I could now say, well, ooh, I'm going to find noisy string to be a fixed string of n, and it resets. So that's another uh, Thing we might be able to do here, adding more stuff in to make the type more useful. So CRTP is a way of pulling things up into a base library and saying here's some common stuff and I can use it for injecting functionality into my class. Oh, I want some of that relational operator, I want some of this stuff, I want some of that stuff. Um, and it's a sort of kind of mix-in approach. Policies don't do this one because they're essentially an out call. They're, uh, they're an up call and out call, they're eff effectively strategy pattern. Um, and they're a way of uh, parameterizing things. Validation logic would be an example. What are the range of values? Remember before I had high and low? Well, maybe I could do that one. Maybe I need something a little more dynamic. So let's have a look here. Non-negative checker. So I'm going to have a non-negative checker. Notice this is a constructor. So here, back to my quantity, and I have ordered of quantity like this and a constructor checker here, so I'm doing multiple inheritance, but since neither has any state, that's not a problem. So this still has the right size. The constructor of order will get called, that's a default constructor, nothing there. Constructor checker this guy, that will call that, and then this one here, const expert. So we can now do this at compile time or at runtime, and I'll get that throw. 
So constexpr is nice. It essentially runs the compiler or cut down version of the compiler at compile time, executes your code and says, here's the results, and then throw stuff away. <laughs> just leaves you with the results. Uh, the C++11 version was a little limited. Uh, C++14 uh, basically broadened things out nicely and said, yes, we can do a lot more with that. Um, when I say can't initialize a string, you can do it, but you have to sort of kind of cheat because you have to say, well, if you produce a double-quoted string like that and I can see it and it's not a const char star, I can pass it a const array, it can be done. But if that const check constructor here, if this doesn't complete, it does the throw, that will then be signaled as an error, a compile time error, and you'll get this thing saying, here's a problem. So there's a bit of fun there. What does this do? Now we've added in this constructor logic. Right, so cons expr of a negative number won't compile. Thank you. If I do runtime, it will throw out runtime. If it doesn't, bang, I'm back to what I had before. So all that stuff completely removed. So that's const expr stuff over there, but I get exactly the same results. So I've done all this complex stuff and checking, and I'm still down to one instruction. Uh, and the other one will be... Notice, however, what I've not put, though, is that because of this, if you remember the one I had back here that had all this stuff in it, this one here, this one had no constructor logic in it. That one because I put construction logic, is now much more complicated because it's doing a lot more checks. This one doesn't have any checks in it. You have to decide whether you want the checks or not. Because that will blindly carry on and go, yeah, you can give me a negative number and I don't want it. But that one won't. So what have we got here then? So we're, what we're starting to do is to define a domain type. So instead of saying, yeah, we can have all the possible operations and all the possible values, I've cut it down and said, right, it's only this range of values and this range of size. We're actually starting to do a bit of uh, proper OO programming here at the lowest level instead of uh, the other examples we might use. We just sort of kind of cut it down to size. Instead of using primitives, we're using the things that make sense. In other words, here are the things that don't make sense. Here are the things that allow you to mix stuff up. But we're only saying this is the valid part in the middle. Actually, this is just basic object orientation. If I use primitives, like int, then what happens is that everywhere that I use that integer, I essentially have to have a set of business rules and logic that say, oh, I need to do all the checking that it's in the right value and I don't take it out of the range and other things. And that's all sort of kind of implicit in your code somewhere. Those rules that are spread around in lots of places. Well, I'm only using that bit of it, so I need these rules here. It's hard to see that. You haven't actually uh, put this in any particular uh, place. If, on the other hand, you say, I actually just, I move it into the type itself at zero cost, yeah, we're in a much better place. As an example, if I have something representing stock level and it says it's minus one, there's minus one thing on the shelf. Obviously wrong. Where is the problem? Um, oh, okay, right, so grep is now your friend, so you're now starting to grep through the code and trying to work out what thing has done minus equals or added or plus a negative number on your type here. But there's no help. Whereas if you do over here, you go, well, okay, I can start putting rules in here. This is actually a more general kind of thing, so uh, this isn't just about the low-level thing, this is in general, so an example that comes up in, in the world of NoSQL and big data is, yeah, I've got JSON. I can throw some stuff at it. That's great. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can just add extra fields. It doesn't particularly matter. So you just save your data in whatever format. So use NoSQL document store. You throw it in. And then you try to read it, and you go, ah. So what happens in the case with reading that one is you go, well, OK, somebody's thrown some stuff in here, now I try to read it. Oh, dear, I haven't got anything there. I don't know what to do with that, or the field I'm expecting isn't there. Actually, you give me an int, and I wanted a, I wanted a string. So in the world of, of, uh, sort of NoSQL and big data, this is often referred to as a schema on read versus a schema on write. Schema on read says, yeah, you throw whatever in, and, and I'll, I'll read it. There's a schema, there's some expectation on the read side, 
If you do this, essentially you're saying schema on write. And this is where you know, an SQL database says, right, I'm gonna write the rules and you can only put it in this format. You can't read the wrong type. So we're starting to move into the area of building proper domain types. Now we can start adding proper logic to these ones. So instead of using a string, I can now use something like a postcode. So I have my postcode class, and now I can do postcode validation. There are 1.8 million postcodes that are valid. Why don't I just actually go and check it's one of them? I can do lookup. I can do you know, OX, whatever, something rather than say, show me the Oxford postcodes. Um, I can do that kind of stuff, but I can't do it if I'm just using raw strings. On ISBN 10, ISBN 13, they have validation, you have lookup, and is this actually really an ISBN, or do, do I just need to do all that complicated thing with the multiplications or whatever to work out? Credit card numbers, those kind of things. I can have a point, I can start doing distance calculations. Ooh, how far is it from there to there? Oh, well, I'm gonna assume the Earth is flat, so it's like that, or I can do this sort of kind of the bendy, the world is apparently not flat. I think it was a C programmer that told me that. But, um, so I can then do those sort of kind of calculations. Um, I can also convert. If I have this type and have that type, I have meters, I have feet. How do I convert from one to the other? Rather than just sprinkling magic constants in there, I can now do this in my types. Um, at zero cost, or in terms of zero cost in terms of size and runtime. I can do the unit speed. I can now say, well, okay, I can do my compile time stuff. I can do, uh, so for feet and meters, that's a compile time uh, constant. Currency obviously doesn't, uh, is, uh, has to be runtime. I was speaking to some people earlier on this week and they had an interesting one where they got pixels where some of their algorithms were using uh, integers for pixel addresses and some using doubles. So for the pixel addresses that were integers, then it was the, the coordinate, the pixel essentially was the bottom left, but if it was a double, it was in the middle. So they actually spent a whole pile of their time having to add a half and take away a half to do this one. And this would actually just move it around. You go, half a pixel isn't that much, and it says, well, it does actually matter in their particular case, because that may be whether the ball went over the line or not, and whether you won the FA Cup. So for some people, half a pixel can make a lot of difference. Um, I was doing some stuff with Quark Express. Quark Express has got two coordinate systems in it. One there like this one, which is zero, zero, and the other one which is offset by one pixel. It's really annoying to have two and easy to mix them up. This year just happens to be the 50th anniversary of Simula 1967, the first OO language. Yay! Can we actually start doing some object orientation, please, rather than, use, <laughs> rather than using hints and primitives? It's only 50 years old. I think we kind of proved the technology, and Simula 67 was one of the driving forces behind Struthrop inventing C++, because he said he wanted the nice features of Simula to be able to represent that, but he was unhappy at the speed. So his world has been trying to get Simula uh, at speed, which is why he started off with a preprocessor on C. So overhead alert, I said there was no overhead here. I said that if you are putting validation logic into constructors, if you're returning, if you're creating temporaries, you're doing you know, money plus money, returning money by value, you're calling the constructor. And therefore, you're going to have that check. Now, do you consider that overhead or not? It is, it's a domain overhead. So you have to tell me whether you think that should be right or not. Is the cost of uh, guaranteeing valid values at runtime, is that uh, acceptable for your increase in safety? I don't know. I don't know in your application whether that's necessary or not. Should this be a compile time option? Should you be able to assert this and then turn it off with deb end debug or some similar thing like that? I don't know. That's, that's for you to decide, but here are some techniques you can do that one with. Um, and can we do it at compile time? Can we do some proofs instead about this one? Um, so here's an example from Captain Proto, which is a serialization library. They have a guarded int. Um, guarded int 10, guarded int 15, like this. And if you, tr if you add these two together, what you get is a guarded int that is 25. So max 1, max 2, and you get that one. So it basically is worked out what the range can be. That's fine. It's very simple. It's 
uh, somewhat simpler than the quantity example with, you know, with uh, possibly nine template parameters. But uh, that's an example where you can do something very straightforward. And you can therefore work out compile time. It's very, because this is a compile, these are compile time constants, you can work out what the range of that thing is. So you can do that one. So we've eliminated that, uh, that check because we can immediately say, look, this could overflow or this could not overflow. So there are a few other things to think about this one. I've shown you small stuff, small primitive repl uh, replacement. But as systems get larger, then what happens is you get more types. So roughly as you scale your code, n like this, you get order n types. But the trouble with having order n types is there are now order n squared possible combinations and possible ways of getting it wrong. So this is why I mentioned things like having, an, having a, a pixel which is uh, offset at the bottom or a double or two coordinate systems. Um, then this is, it's quite easy to end up mixing those ones up. It's quite easy to end up creating more things than you really want. So as you tend to scale systems, they often become more strongly typed. And you miss this as you get larger. You go, oh, oh, really, there's just too many ways of getting this wrong. C++ templates, for instance, Strangely enough, they're not typed. Type name T just says it's a type name. C++ concepts, however, are essentially trying to apply temp uh, type checking to template arguments. This is why, we've because we've now discovered that as templates get bigger, we want more of that. So how do templates work, and how do concepts work? Well, let's have a look at this. This is a timeline from left to right on the top here. So the top part is the OO, traditional sort of kind of C-sharp Java kind of thing, and I've got an interface or abstract base class here. I have an abstract base class. I have a, uh, a client and a server, both of which use that. One talks to it, the other implements it. But notice it's always backwards in time. You can only have compiled time dependencies and stuff backwards in time. And this means the interface has to come first. This has an advantage, however, because it says, right, okay, so if the client tries to pass an integer where the interface is expecting a string, it says, no, that's wrong. And I don't even need to know what this guy's doing. Completely separate. If, on the other hand, I try to call dot size on an integer passed here, the, so that says, no, this won't compile. So I get independent compilation by this one. So the idea of having a contract means independent compilation, which is really nice and straightforward. It is, however, a planned whitelist. You're allowed to say, these are things that are planned to go together. I can't do ad hoc stuff. I have to work out uh, what I want to be able to be combined and not. With templates, however, we'll come back to concepts in a moment, I have a template T that says I just take some T. I have an X, completely unrelated. And now look at the dependency. It's the other way around. So instead of this dependency, it's now the instantiation of that template that requires the template itself and the X and says, does that work? And this is actually one of the reasons that templates are so powerful, because you can say, oh, look, I can have that thing and that thing. I didn't, nobody had to tell me they were allowed to go together. I can just put them together and go, do they fit? Fantastic. Vector of T and int. <coughs> Wouldn't it be really annoying if you had to have int inherit from some I'm allowed to be put in a collection interface, which is what you have in other languages? which is why you have to have a vector of, or collection of Java lang integer, not ints. Concepts are essentially trying to do this interface trick, but with templates. And they're basically saying, ah, the requirements of that are this. And does that meet those requirements? So this is a concepts light stuff uh, that's available in G++ um, G++6. Um, we hope to have better error messages and the same or better compilation speed. Let's have a look. So let's try this. So I have, this is what a concept looks like, has operator less than. So returns requires, so it takes two parameters, t1, t2, and the syntax says, is that, is that code well formed? Does that work or not? And now I can use that like this. Instead of saying type name, I say, look, here, you can only put things here that actually have an operator less than that know how to do that. OK, fine. Right. That's kind of good. This is all the rest of the same. I then come and try and use it. And I go, class year, public ordered year. Oh, it doesn't compile. 
Damn. Why doesn't this compile? Well, this doesn't compile because at this point, year is not a complete type. And it goes, well, I don't know. Does this have an operator less than? I don't know. So it can't do it. That's a bit of a... So that my first attempt at writing a concept, and I've hit the wall straight away. Ah, damn. Well, there is a way of doing this, I discovered. So a bit of uh, stack overflowing, and I came up with the following, which is instead of constraining this particular argument like this, I leave that unconstrained, and I put a requires clause on the end of this that says for operator greater than, it has to be have something that's operator less than. And now that compiles. Yay! So now I've got concepts in there. Let's see what that does. So we hope this is going to give us better error messages. Let's see if it does. So here I have x. It has n obviously has nothing in it. It has no operator less than, and I try to... Uh, implement that, say, greater than. So this is without concepts. It goes, uh, horrible, 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 uh, required no match for operator less than here. But I'm, I'm not calling that. So this is in some other library. This is not in my stuff. I can't see that. That's not very helpful. Right, so that's the error message without the concepts. With the concepts, I get a nice error message. No match for operator greater than. Types with XX like this, uh, candidates are this one here, etc. Uh, with X, etc., the required expression T will be ill formed. Operator less than. So it actually tells me why I can't do this. So I'm getting some safety here. I'm getting some stuff that actually not only isn't safe, but actually helping me. With strings, then uh, with and without concepts then I do the same kind of thing. This is, do I have a policy that fits or not? Uh, so here we go, right, so this is without, uh, and it's going, I'm talking to me about overflow here when I try to do that one, oh, that's a bit, a bit odd. Um, whereas in this case it says template constraint. I can't put an X in there because it doesn't have overflow because overflow will be all formed. Okay, it's not quite as good. I think this is a quality of implementation issue, but basically that's the idea of using uh, concepts. There are a lot of things that this leads into. This is really just a, a, a dip of uh, dipping my toe into the waters with this one. So here are lots of things we could talk about. Lots of things we could discuss. And in some ways, I'm throwing. Well, actually, you know, what's this? Are, these are things that came up into my mind when I started thinking about this one. Uh, and I haven't necessar necessarily got answers to some of these questions, but there are some interesting avenues to explore with it. Like compilation times. Is this going to hurt your compilation times? Well, these are, these are tiny little templates. This is not like trying to comp compile um, a regular expression or half of the boost library every time. It's, the, you know, they're 10 lines. So I'm not expecting compilation times to be large in this one here. Um, I mean, trying to find examples of people who are actually using this, particularly people who are using dimensional analysis and other the larger stuff. And I haven't seen a lot of people using this. So I'm going, is this just an idea that's just a nice little idea? And, or is this something that we should be trying to do more of? Should we be encouraging this? Should we be going, hmm, why don't people, if they don't do it, why don't they do it? Is this just laziness? Is this just... It's easier, is this inertia? Is this just some horror that they think this is gonna be terrible? Or is it just that they haven't done this one? The small talk community, whole value pattern, they tend to do this a lot more. Is this something that you sort of kind of find afterwards? I don't know, there are lots of questions that popped up in my mind when I started to think about this. Also, typing. Type systems are great, but what happens when you get too much typing? Is there such a thing as, as having too much of a type? Well, I think there is, and uh, I'm sure that there were people who would argue about this one. And uh, for instance, the classic one, allocator on a container, that changes the type. Is that something you really want? Is it really a different type? Is fixed string 10 and fixed string 11, are they actually different types, or they, should they be the same type? Or should you have a conversion between them that says, yeah, I can do fixed string plus fixed string, and I'll tell you whether it was going to break or not? and what to do about it. Um, as an example, I saw something this week. Somebody wanted to have a whole series of, um, they wanted to have a, 
they ended up having a tuple of different types when they really were just function, they were um, functional object that had two um, functions that were basically the same. So it had the same structure, but they couldn't put them into a container because they were different types. It was struct X, struct Y, struct Z, but actually they just had this, they were the same. The type system was preventing them putting them together. Scary iterators and all those other kind of things like that. There is, so when's too much typing? How far can you push this? How far should you push this? Pardon? Ada. Ada, <coughs> cough. Exactly. So how well does this scale when you, at, at the, um, in terms of uh, writing software? If you decided to do this everywhere, is this going to work on a, you know, it works in a one-person team and you're doing some stuff in here. What about a five-person team? What happens if you're doing 500 people? Uh, how well is this going to go? My sort of kind of feeling is if you start to say, well, here is a domain type and I've got all the bits and pieces that go with it, all the validation logic, all the maximum minimum values and who the operations, that will probably scale better in the sense because you go, this is actually what I mean, rather than trying to have to reverse engineer out the code every time I look at it. Because you can now get the compiler to shout at you. Not because you're wrong, it's because you don't know. I'm not saying that it's going to be good at compiler errors because you're, you're wrong, but actually if you're trying to use somebody else's code, to, well, the Lockheed Martin and the uh, Mars Climate Orbit, it wasn't that they, that, that they were stupid, they weren't trying, is that they just had primitives. <coughs> And if they didn't do that, there's some interesting areas coming up. People looking in, um, in C++ 20 for types and reflection. Uh, I said you throw it all away. That, uh, all that compile time information gets thrown away. Well, what happens if you could sort of kind of keep it on the side, but not jam it into the object? So here's my objects, here's my ints and my floats, and they're all wrapped up. And by the way, here's all the, all the juicy metadata on the side. Hmm. What does that allow you to do or not to do? Implicit and explicit interfaces. Well, ints and floats. The thing about an int is it can do too much. And the float. You have all the operations that you go like, do I want all those operations or not? Having an explicit interface says I'm going to do just these things. That's fine. But explicit interfaces make you type a lot more. And is this thing going to be laziness? When is laziness going to take over and say, actually, can I just use an int or a float here, please? Expressivity, I've not put on there. If you see a Boolean parameter, call some function true or false, you're going like, what does that mean? Can you use an enum instead? I have to do that one. Um, you can extend this. Things like standard optional coming up in C, in C plus 17. Instead of risk returning, oh, it could do this one, or I could return a null pointer, you can return the optional, the, the maybe type that may or may not have something in there. If I look something up in a map and it's not there, what do I get back? Do I throw? What do I, what do, I do? How do I have some distinguished value? Well, I can have optional that says it's there or not. So the use of, um, of the type system to get rid of some of the uh, awkwardness in some, um, some other parts. Um, standard variant, also coming up in C++ 17. State machines. Uh, can I just have different states and a different struct for every state and then use variants for that? And says so instead of going from one of these ones here and oh, I forgot to update the state variables, can I actually just go, it's a whole new state? Yeah, hey, look, constructor call, bang, I'm in the right place rather than leaving some, oh, I forgot to change that variable kind of stuff. Um, if I end up with too much type, do I end up with type erasure? Is that what I do I somehow manage to get rid of that so I can get rid of it and get rid of the types enough so I can actually use it? So there are all sorts of things that this, this view of types brings up in my mind. Uh, and I could probably write a talk about half of each one of those itself uh, for some time, but I'm not going to do that for you. So what I'm going to do is just say that um, that's enough from me. Um, I'm defining here lightweight domain abstractions this is a domain-specific embedded language approach that's saying use the type system to help you write better code, safer code, clearer, more expressive code that with zero overhead uh, or runtime overhead in terms of CPU memory, 
and look at the use of creating your own domain-specific libraries.